Now that we've examined the ring flip process in detail, let's look at what happens when we replace one of the hydrogens in parent cyclohexane with a substituent. This leads to a mono or singly substituted cyclohexane ring with some interesting properties. By mono substituted, we mean that we've replaced one of the 12 hydrogens in the cyclohexane ring with an R group, where R is some group that we call the substituent. Because the ring flip moves equatorial positions into axial positions and vice versa, a substituent that's equatorial in one of the chair conformers becomes axial in the other chair conformer. The resulting chair structures are not the same because the R group is located in an axial position in one and an equatorial position in the other, we can't overlay these perfectly, indicating that they're different structures. One way to think of them is as conformational isomers, like the anti and gauche isomers of 1,2-dibromoethane, for example. Like those anti and gauche structures, these two molecules thus have different energies, different stabilities. And typically, the isomer in which the substituent is in an axial position is less stable than the isomer in which the substituent is in an equatorial position. One of the reasons for this has to do with 1,3-diaxial interactions that are present in the axial conformational isomer but are missing from the equatorial structure. Here's a molecular model of the axial conformer of methylcyclohexane. Notice that the axial substituent is relatively close to the other axial groups on the same side of the molecule. In this case, these are hydrogens. The two hydrogens here and here are relatively close to the atoms of the methyl group. As we've seen, the electron clouds around these atoms extend beyond the spheres that you see here. And as a result, there's some overlap between the electron clouds of the methyl group and the other two axial hydrogens on the same side of the molecule. This is what we refer to as a 1,3-diaxial interaction, and it's steric strain that destabilizes the axial conformer. Gauche interactions between the substituent and the carbon-carbon bonds in the ring, two bonds away, are also an important destabilizing factor of the axial conformer, and we can see these if we rotate this structure into a Newman projection view. Notice that looking down one of the carbon-carbon bonds of the ring, we can now see that the carbon substituent bond is gauche to one of the carbon-carbon bonds within the ring, one of the bonds two bonds away. From the parallel lines orientation, this bond from a ring carbon to the substituent is gauche to this bond here. It's also gauche, in fact, to this bond here on the other side of the molecule. And we can see that if we once again rotate the molecule into an alternate Newman projection view, like so, we see that here again that carbon substituent bond is gauche to one of the bonds within the ring. Those two gauche interactions destabilize the axial conformer relative to the equatorial conformer. Of course, it's worth verifying that the equatorial conformer lacks these interactions, and so let's take a look at that next. Here's the equatorial conformer of methylcyclohexane with the substituent in an equatorial position. Now, of course, one three diaxial interactions are not an issue, since now the only groups that are axial are hydrogens in the structure. In addition, if we focus on that Newman projection view that we looked at previously, we see that now the substituent is no longer gauche to carbon-carbon bonds within the ring. In fact, now the carbon substituent bond is anti to the carbon-carbon bond within the ring two bonds away, and the substituent is gauche only to hydrogens in this structure, indicating that in the equatorial conformer, gauche interactions are not an issue. Exactly how much less stable the axial conformer is than the equatorial conformer depends, of course, on the identity of the substituent. The larger the steric effect of the substituent, the less stable the axial conformer, as these gauche interactions and 1,3-diaxial interactions start becoming more destabilizing as, this, as the steric effect of the substituent grows. We quantify this using the thermodynamic energy difference between the axial and equatorial conformers. These are both chair conformations, and so they're both stable states of the molecule. However, one is more stable than the other. The difference in energy between them is referred to as the A value for the substituent. And we can think of it as a sum of the interactions we described in the last slide. One, three diaxial interactions and gauche interactions involving the substituent. On a conformational coordinate diagram, for example, the A value is the energy difference here from the equatorial conformer to the axial conformer. This table gives us a sense of typical A values for different types of substituents. D refers to deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen with one neutron and one proton. And you can see that its A value is extremely tiny, six thousandths of a kilocalorie per mole, which makes sense because it's 
basically hydrogen. Moving to single atom substituents like the halogens causes the A value to increase, but not by much, only about half a kilocalorie per mole. This group with the carbon-carbon triple bond has a lot to teach us about the origin of the A value. It's not just about the raw size of the substituent. Clearly, a group containing two carbons and a hydrogen is going to be considerably larger than a bromine atom, but the increase in A value doesn't correlate with that increase in size. So it's not just about the size of the group. It's really about the steric effect, the extent of the electron clouds around the group in the vicinity of, for example, the gauche carbon-carbon bonds in the axial conformer and these axial hydrogens two atoms away that plug into 1,3-diaxial interactions. Because the carbon-carbon triple bond has a linear geometry, its steric effect is actually not that large, right? If we overlay a triple bond here quickly, we can see that it actually doesn't extend to a large degree above the cyclohexane ring. It's mostly just linear. There is some overlap here, but it's not nearly as bad as, for example, situations where an sp3 hybridized carbon shows up directly bound to the cyclohexane ring. And we can see that in the A values. Methyl's A value is considerably larger than the carbon-carbon triple bond. That's because the methyl substituent extends hydrogens out over the ring, and so its steric effect, especially in 1,3-diaxial interactions, is much larger than the impact of the carbon-carbon triple bond. That effect only grows as we add more substituents. But interestingly, notice that it doesn't grow much when we replace one of the hydrogens with a methyl group to generate the ethyl group. Only a 0.05 increase from here to here. This again makes the point that it's about the steric effect. The ethyl substituent can orient itself so that the added methyl group is pointed away from the ring. And so from the perspective of, for example, the other two axial up hydrogens, an ethyl group looks a lot like a methyl group. This explains the very small increase in going from methyl to ethyl here. There's even not that much of an increase when we replace yet another methyl group going from ethyl to isopropyl. Because once again, the substituent can rotate so that only one of its H's is positioned over the ring. This means that its steric impact isn't as large as we'd expect, for example, if we had to put a methyl group out over top of the ring, which is what happens for the tert-butyl substituent. In replacing that last hydrogen with a methyl group, we see a very large increase in A value to greater than 4 kilocalories per mole. What's happened here is all of a sudden we can't place the hydrogen out over the ring. It's necessary now to place a methyl group out over the ring. And now the steric impact of that methyl group can't really be avoided by rotation of the substituent. And so the A value becomes very large as that methyl group is bumping heavily into the axial hydrogens two carbons away. One other interesting trend to point out here is the difference between OH and NH2. Both of these substituents can rotate to put the hydrogens away from the cyclohexane ring, minimizing the impact of the hydrogens. The real difference between OH and NH2 comes in the extent of the lone pairs. That is how big the non-bonding lone pair orbitals are, since these are more than likely what will stick out over the ring in the most stable conformation. It actually makes sense in going from a more electronegative to a less electronegative element that the size of the lone pair orbital would get larger. And this explains a good deal of the increase in A value in going from oxygen to nitrogen. We can also think about this from a pure atomic size standpoint. We would expect the nitrogen atom to be larger than the oxygen atom, just based on the periodic trend in atomic size, and we'd expect that to contribute to this A value increase as well.